I'm ready to introduce our first speaker, whose name is John Dorst. He teaches in the American Studies program at the University of Wyoming. John got his BA in English from Oberlin College, his MA in Folklore from Berkeley, and his PhD in Folklore from the University of Pennsylvania. He specializes in folklore studies, in documentary writing, in material culture, and out of his interest in material culture comes his ongoing interest in food and American cuisine. Um, he's been a former member of the Humanities Council Board. He's had Guggenheim and Fulbright fellowships. He's working now on a book on taxidermy. Um, today he's going to talk to us about his interest in food, and his talk is called What is a Cuisine? Please welcome John Dorst. Why is it that, how do I understand the fact that when I teach this, this class called Food in American Culture, um, which I do every couple of years, the students have a, um, a pretty hard time talking in any detail or with any nuance about their own daily food experience. They don't seem to have a, a, a language that's very adequate to the, the subtleties and the, and the details of how they actually eat or to help them think about how they eat. Um, and that's not to say that they can't say anything about their food experience. Certainly they, they can, but at least at first in our conversations, they fall back on what really are cliches or uh, generalizations about their food experience. For example, the notion of eating a balanced diet, which to some degree means what we probably mostly mean about that, you know, that, that you have nutritionally balanced meals. But there's a, sort of this folk wisdom among college students, and maybe it's more than college students, that they can eat compensatorily um, and have a balanced diet, meaning that if they overindulge in something uh, on one day, that the next day they can do the opposite and somehow it will balance out. Um, <laughs> You know, where that, you know, I don't think that's grounded very much in nutritional science, but that's, that's their, their common notion. Um, or uh, we'll have students who say that they like spicy food, for example, and when pressed to, to say a little bit more about what that means, um, they have a hard time elaborating or going deeper into what that means. So, uh, you know, kimchi spicy, curry spicy, Tex-Mex spicy, um, and they, they, they're just spicy is, is a category for them. So there are a lot of things that might help us understand why there seems to be this disparity between uh, how much attention we seem to be paying to food in American culture today and the inability uh, or the limited um, array of ways we have for talking, especially about our everyday eating. And uh, the one dimension of this that I really want to talk about today is um, what I think is par partly an explanation for that, and it's the fact that, that we are living in, I think, a mostly a, a post-cuisine world. And uh, that idea depends upon uh, a particular understanding of a, what cuisine means. And I forgot to turn my thing on here, so somebody's going to have to give me a high sign as I'm getting closer to my time here. Um, so what is, what is a cuisine? Um, the, the word, of course, uh, is just French for, for kitchen or the extended notion of kitchen, uh, uh, kitchen and cookery. Uh, and there are all sorts of cognate words, cucina, cucina, uh, küche in German, that are essentially the same, the same term. Um, we have uh, come to use that word, cuisine, I think, in two basic ways in our common parlance, our common use of language. One is to refer to things like national cuisines, you know, Chinese cuisine, French cuisine, Italian cuisine, or, re or maybe regional cuisines like Tex-Mex cuisine. Um, although, it, if we're thinking about the language we have to use for food, um, the fact that, that some kinds of national um, food profiles we refer to more typically as cuisines and others we refer to as food is itself an interesting distinction. I mean, we, it's not uncommon to talk about French cuisine or Italian cuisine, when we talk about Mexican cuisine, we more typically say Mexican food, I think. Um, why is that? Does, that? does that mean anything that we have those two different words for different kinds of, of food profiles or, or national experiences? Anyway, that's one way we use the word cuisine. The other way we use it typically, I think, is to refer to styles of cooking. Uh, so uh, we talk about haute cuisine, elite food, high cuisine or what used to be called nouvelle cuisine back in the 90s, a sort of fancy you know, cuisine that had tiny little portions with uh, colorfully drizzled sauces around the plate, 
um, a sort of food is art kind of cuisine. Or um, California cuisine, which is was a general term for the emergence in the, in the 70s already of that style of cooking that uh, used fresh ingredients, locally sourced ingredients, um, a kind of uh, light fare um, that moved away from, especially in restaurants, from the heavier kinds of fine dining that were typical before. That really transformed, um, that's transformed our, our restaurant uh, dining in a lot of ways. So um, both of these uses of the word cuisine, the kind of reference to national cuisines or styles of, of cooking, um, are not about our everyday experience. They're about the special sorts of uh, relationships we have to food, uh, like going out to restaurants or going to food festivals or, or maybe cooking um, gourmet meals for ourselves on, on unusual occasions. I want to uh, propose an alternative or uh, uh, steal an alternative notion of, of cuisine from um, the social sciences, especially from anthropology. And this is the concept of cuisine I like, and the one I'd like to propose we spend a little time thinking about. And let me just, sorry about all the text, I'll just read through it here. This is from Sidney Mintz, who uh, uh, was a major um, food anthropologist, major figure in, in food studies. What makes a cuisine is not a set of recipes aggregated in a book or a series of particular foods associated with a particular setting, but uh, something more. I think a, a cuisine requires a population that eats that cuisine with sufficient frequency to consider themselves experts in it. They all believe and care that they believe that they know what it consists of, how it is made, and how it should taste. In short, a genuine cuisine has common social roots. It is the food of a community, albeit often a very large community. So he's talking about um, the kinds of eating that we do every day uh, and that we share, and the knowledge, not just the food itself, but the knowledge and the language that we have to relate to that food. Uh, and, and he's not saying that everybody knows how to make necessarily the food or the cuisine, that, that, that uh, in cuisine communities you have specialization of expertise. Uh, so some people are the cooks and some people are the eaters. But uh, you do have a, a shared body of knowledge and understanding of the food. And you're, you, you feel that you have the capacity to judge it, to say that's a good version of that dish or, um, or that one. Uh, falls short in my, or in my family we do it this way. Your family, I recognize it as the same food, but it's different in a particular way. So, to elaborate on, on this definition of cuisine a little bit, um, it's not so much a formal definition as just a, a general characterization of food experience that he's talking about. So it's not a, a precise, tidy thing, which I think is, for me, useful because it's looseness um, as a concept uh, uh, lets us get away from thinking about cuisine as just a, a box of stuff that you might have as, uh, or that you might partake of as an eater, but views it as a more dynamic thing, um, not something that, that belongs to just a group of people or that a group of people has. Um, and also, it thinks of, of the food community not as just a group of people, but as a community, as people who already share things uh, that you know other members of that community, usually in some kind of face-to-face -face encounter. Not everybody in the community necessarily, but you know others who you share food behavior and your cuisine with. So if you take this view of what a cuisine is, um, you're, you're, you're having to abandon some of the associations we have with those first two notions of cuisine. For example, the idea of a national cuisine kind of goes out the window in this conception, because that's just too big a thing. And um, citizens of a nation state are not necessarily all participants in the same daily cuisine experience. So um, to, say, to say Chinese cuisine, um, we have a, a, a general sense of what that means. But in practice, there are many, many, many uh, Chinese cuisines, right? And uh, some of them might be very local and very, very small scale. Uh, Cuisine is tied not just to a community of people, but also to a place. So cuisine, in this sense, um, is uh, connected to the fact that um, in a, an environment provides a reliable source of basic food items that are fundamental to what that cuisine is. So connection to place, connection to environment. Um, 
Cuisine, in this sense, is not a fixed thing. It's a living system that includes both people and uh, food itself. And we have to consider food and things related to food as fully participatory in the living system of a cuisine in this sense. And cuisines, in this sense, don't have precise boundaries. And I think David may be talking about phenomena of the way cuisines mix, the way things come together. So the boundaries are not uh, firm um, in terms of one cuisine in relation to another. And there's ongoing, constant um, hybridization across cuisines all the time, if they're living, true living cuisines. And as I've said, cuisine in this sense has much more to do with our daily experience, our everyday eating, than with these special experiences uh, of restaurants and festivals and so on. And cuisine, in this sense, is not just about the food itself. It's not just about the food items. It's about the whole ball of wax. It's about everything that is related to our food experience. How we socialize around food. How we procure it. Um, who cleans up? What's the division of labor in a food community? Um, who's responsible for what in relationship to food? Are all questions that we can ask. And, and it becomes a more interesting, basically my argument, it becomes a more interesting conversation if we have all of these dimensions of food experience to talk about. And cuisine in this sense is a name for um, that kind of food experience. So, um, the elements of living cuisines. Uh, first, a, a brief a word. and, and, and um, Rhoda is the specialist on this, and so, so her talk uh, coming up next will address more the nutritional aspects of, of food waste. But uh, cuisines have uh, always inherently a kind of nutritional profile. They're only, they can only exist because they do satisfy basic nutritional needs. Because they're adaptive, um, they are uh, a reflection of how people have chosen from the available environment foods that uh, satisfy biological requirements. So, uh, anthropologists, comparative anthropologists have shown how all cuisines in this sense have, uh, typically have a high yield starch component, like a main staple grain, for example, or in some cases root vegetables. Um, they al almost always have also a plant protein source, so beans or legumes, for example, in a lot of cuisines, in, in indigenous North American cuisine, for example. Uh, also, mostly cuisines have a s often supplementary animal protein source, dairy or meat, usually not as a central component, although there are cuisines like uh, among indigenous peoples living above the Arctic Circle um, where meat um, and flesh is, is absolutely a, a staple. Also, cuisines typically have a high yield um, set of so-called protective foods foods that have those vegetables, uh, have, those, have those vitamins and minerals that, um, uh, that the body can't produce for itself. So uh, fruits and vegetables uh, in relatively high yields are typical of cuisines. They usually have some source, at least small source, of oils and fats. And then frequently, not always, but frequently, they have a backup um, starch source. So a second crop that if the first crop fails or, uh, in other words, the cuisine a living, active, uh, effective cuisine is one that has a kind of flexibility to it um, that responds to changing environmental in, uh, conditions. So, um, with that basic idea of cuisine in mind, um, we could ask, um, it, I think, more interesting questions than we usually ask of our foods, if we ask any questions of our foods and how we eat day to day. Um, and one of those questions is, what does a cuisine look like? This is a, a photograph, I've read a couple here from a really interesting book, which I recommend, called What the World Eats, um, by author Peter Menzel and a photographer, Faith D'Aloisio, uh, which came out in, in 2008. And what they did was they traveled around the world and they um, uh, stayed with families and uh, talked to them about their food, and then they assembled uh, everything that that family eats over the course of a week and laid it all out and took pictures of it. And this is the uh, uh, Kevin family in Cal California, and with the array of, of the food items that are part of their, that reflect their everyday eating. So, um, we obviously can, can say things about the content of this, um, the kinds of, I mean, the obvious 
high percentage of processed foods, for example. But we also might ask questions about when, when I say, what does it look like? We might literally ask, what does it look like? What colors do we see? What are the sizes and textures that we um, can perceive in the array of, of foods that, that are part of the everyday cuisine, if you want to call it that, of this family? I'll come back to this in a minute. Let's look at a couple of, of others. Um, this is the Mendoza's of uh, Guatemala, a kind of uh, prosperous family of eight and their uh, food supply for the course of a week um, in the month of uh, November, which is an important point here, that you have to specify uh, what month this ref reflects. Okay. So the obvious differences between what we saw in the Caven food profile and what we're seeing here um, probably don't need too much comment. Uh, <laughs> but again, we can ask that question. What are the, you know, what are the, um, uh, what's the difference between what we saw before and the quality of, the visual qualities of the food that we see here uh, in terms of volume, proportion of one thing to another, uh, the texture and colors of the items. All of those are cuisine, in my sense, or the anthropological sense, cuisine questions. At this point, if this were my class, I'd be, I'd be asking you, and maybe I will in a minute, to, to see what, you, what you're seeing in these photographs. Let me just, let me just show you one more before we do that. Um, a Turkish family, the Çeliks of Istanbul, um, with uh, quite a different set of food items. But probably if I asked that question, okay, if you wanted, if you wanted to categorize these three reflections of cuisines, reflections of a, a, a weekly set of food items, you, you probably lump two of them together as more like than the third. Am I, is that an obvious thing to say? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually act like this is a class and ask you that question. What, 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 what are you seeing in, in this um, array of weekly foods of this Turkish family that are um, the qualities of it as a visual qualities of it as a cuisine. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Right? Not recognizing a lot of this. I can see the starch yeah. in, in the other one. It's, I, I don't know what the starch is. The, the main thing here is the bread. Right? Um, the centrality of, of bread in this, this week, that's, that's, the sta that's the staple starch. Not to put too fine a point on it. There are potatoes. There are potatoes as well. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think this family of uh, six, extended family of six, eat something like 32 loaves of bread a week. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a lot of grain. It's <laughs> a lot of starch. Um, they don't appear to be all that overweight. You know, people that have yeah. bread out of their diet. The, yeah, yeah the, the notion that... Yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and, and that, of course, that kind of question. Why, again, living active cuisines tend to be um, even though they, they, may, and they usually do have this central large staple item, like bread, um, are still what we would call balanced and lead to healthy, um, you know, healthy life or healthy bodies. And uh, why that is, is, is an interesting cuisine question. What, what, what else is going on in the diet? Yeah, they have, yeah, they have bottle, yeah, it's a big bottle of water. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Coke and Pepsi, yeah. Mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, if you, and one thing, you know, we could go through this and we could just count up the number of things that are in packages versus the things that aren't in packages and, and you know, comparatively tiny, tiny percentage, even, even less so in, in the case of the Guatemalan food. Yeah, uh, eggs, eggs if, if, if the bread is the um, sort of staple uh, starch source or, or um, grain source, Eggs are central to the uh, protein, animal protein component in this diet. So a lot of eggs, like two dozen eggs. I just felt that the, compared, especially compared to that person, they left people are a lot closer to their food. They have a, the food there. You can nice. pick it up. You don't have to go through a box or yeah. plastic to get to your food. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's real food. Yeah, which, you know, the, the, the food writer Michael Pollan would say, you know, his three, his three recommendations about how we should eat is, eat, his first one is eat food, <laughs> by which he means exactly what you're saying. This is food. Food is stuff that eventually will rot, for example. Um, a lot of what we saw on the, on the Caven's uh, kitchen table, 
would sit in the shelf forever and you could, you could use it much later. Uh, I should say here that my point is not so much to, to make invidious comparisons between what seem like um, healthier or, and we all know that, that the Mediterranean diet, so-called, is good for us. Um, so I'm not, I'm not so much um, talking about the nutritional uh, benefits or, or uh, problems with these different sets of foods, but with the cultural aspects of them. In a, in a world that is like this, a, a food world like this, it see, just seems to me that there's a lot more to talk about and be interested in, in your food. Um, you can talk about, well, that, those bananas, you know, we got, we can talk about that in our culture too, but um, those bananas were uh, overripe. Or, you know, well, the bread this week, and it might, this is one thing about living cuisines, um, because things are not standardized and prepackaged, they might vary from one week to the next, you know, might, the bread might, might not be as good this week that you got from the baker. Um, how you put things together, whether, because, because this is food that needs more processing in the home, you have to cook more to eat, eat this, um, it means that you are, um, there are risks involved, right? You could do it well or it could fail sometimes, or you, uh, from one um, manifestation, you know, the, the dolmas, the, the stuffed grape leaves, which is a, a really a regular component of this diet, um, might, uh, you know, the mi rice might be uh, especially well done in one week's version of it and not so well done in the next, and that's something to talk about. And that in itself is, uh, from my point of view, uh, a good thing about living cuisines. Yeah. You were talking about discussion of foods, yeah. and we go by food, and right. it's always processed, so it's no use in discussing it because all you have to do is go down. Yeah. But it appears in both of these societies, they cook their food yeah. like they yeah. Really yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it may, I think it's probably from a baker, but it's the baker around the corner. You probably know the baker, right? Yeah. Like the food that they have has to be processed yeah. at home yeah. rather than in the store. Yeah, yeah. Living cuisines are cooking. Are are are, 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 are um, you know, cooking is central to them to be a living cuisine. The the amount of time that has to be spent to do that. Um, is much larger, and that means that we have just have more to talk about because more people are also involved in it, right? Um, everybody's probably got some food-related job in the household in a living cuisine, in a way that you may not, or much less have much less so in, in a post-cuisine environment. Um, let me just go back to the Guatemalan case. Um, we could ask what the similarities between this and the, and the Turkish case are. I mean, what they're different food items. And the staple item is different, but you can see what it is, right? Pretty quickly. Maybe maybe it's hard to tell what this this whole um, this this and this are all. There are three things. There are three items here. These are tortillas already made. This is masa dough um, from maize to make tortillas, and this is corn. So that's clearly the central staple of this diet, the way bread and wheat products are the, the starch staple of the, um, the Turkish family. Yeah, a lot of eggs. It, there's very little meat protein in this diet. They, uh, in fact, in this month, um, they had two chickens, and that was pretty much the, the extent, and those were for a special, uh, special festival occasion. Uh, so meat was not, was not part of the regular uh, daily eating. The protein, the, the plant proteins, beans and other things are the main source of protein in this in this diet. The Turkish diet has more meat in it than, than this one does. Um, so that's another interesting thing. Yeah, David. So what is the Quaker oats product? Um, it's, it's, I think it's instant oatmeal. In fact, it is. Oh, instant yeah. So why, yeah, and why? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to look at these pictures because you can, you can start asking the question, well, where are we seeing things coming from one well, some, from the post-cuisine world, as I'm calling it, into a cuisine world like this. And you start seeing things like packaged instant oatmeal for some reason. Um, it would take more investigation to see what part that plays in their diet. I assume they're eating it basically the way we would as a breakfast food um, and not as part of other dishes. But, but who knows? Yeah, it might, be, it might be used for something entirely different. Right? And that's another aspect of why cuisines in this sense are interesting. It's because a lot investigating them becomes a much more interesting activity, I think, than um, investigating kind of in an academic way or, or um, uh, even, even sort of quasi-academic way to, to think and talk about how they get put together, what their structures are, 
um, what, what the rules of the cuisine are becomes a more interesting question, I think, than in, um, in uh, a food <laughs> behavior that's, that's reflected here. Yeah, where, where you think you could um, cultivate. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, that uh, you know, that's that's kind of that's kind of coming around to to where I eventually want to go here, which is that that um, we can also make choices about these things, right? I mean, one aspect of cuisine, in the sense that I'm talking about it here, is that it is. Um, I don't quite like the word natural, but there's a way in which we could see it as a it's something that is we are born into in some ways, or we naturally adapt to, or we uh, that it's not so much a conscious adoption of a, a way of eating. It's the stuff that that we recognize as our, our home foods. And um, so f f that may, means that, that um, uh, we take a lot for granted about uh, that, uh, that kind of relationship to food. And that's why we can say that we, are, we share knowledge about cuisines in that sense. We know uh, what's good, what's not good, what the appropriate thing is to have this time of the week uh, versus that time of the week. Uh, that said, though, given that, that cuisines, in that sense, are in some ways n parts of our natural um, daily experience, we can also make choices about them. And, and living in a place where you could have access to more stuff that would require more of that involvement that would lead to more interesting conversations, potentially, about our relationship to food, um, is a choice we can make to some degree. I'd also argue, though, that there's some limits on that in our world that we Westerners live in mostly. In, in these photos, I mean, are they representative of how much of that stuff they eat? Because you could take the same picture and put all the fresh stuff in the back and the front and back the other stuff up, and in the back they look like they're more fruit and vegetables and Yeah. And That's a good question. You, you mean? The way it's set up, I mean, all those colorful boxes way yeah. in the front, if they were way in the back and you have the other stuff in the front, it would probably look like they were actually having a little bit more. How Menzel went about arranging things for the photographs is a good, is a good question. I, I, I do think that um, you, can, you can see enough of it. This, pic, this light is real good to see it. But you can pick out enough of the stuff that's fresh stuff to, to tell the relative proportions between that and the, the package stuff, which is overwhelmingly more. But you're right. I mean, it probably could have been arranged in a way that would suggest. And I think that probably, that's another point I would make, is that even though collectively, maybe, in our Western world, we're living in a post-cuisine environment, we still, all of us, almost all of us anyway, do participate at least minimally in some kind of cuisine experience. It's not all or nothing. That cuisine, in this sense, is a, um, might occupy a portion of our food behavior and our food experience. Um, so that's another reason why this definition or this conception of, of cuisine is, I think, a, a, an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. That, that, that's a fairly small food budget for a small, young, young, relatively young family. I don't know. I don't know about that. You'd think. Um, and and, and uh, one of the things that they do in this book, another reason to, it, that you might be interested in, is that um, following the photographs, he does have a full inventory of what they eat. And looking at beverages between these households is really an interesting thing, too. In, in the Guatemalan household, they're like two different, two or three beverages, and that's all they drink, mostly water. Um, the actually Turkish family drink quite a different variety of things, and that's one of the places where pre-processed um, food items are, are a major part of their diet, that a lot of the things they drink are, uh, you know, processed orange juice or things like that. Um, here, there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of, of packaged processed beverages uh, and many different kinds. Um, that which, by the way, is another, um, another point I want to get to, it, which is the um, proliferation of components of the diet in a cuisine world versus a post-cuisine world. What gets, what gets elaborated? What, what do we see more and more of? Let me, let me just uh, jump ahead to, to this. This is a little bit of the comparison among the, the three families. So the Mendozas eat 60 pounds of corn in the course of a week. Um, and 35, more than 35 pounds of fruit 
and vegetable, fruit, fruit and um, 69 pounds of vegetable. You know, over 100 pounds of fruits and vegetables in, in their diet. Uh, vast majority of it coming in, in fresh form. The tailics eat 49.4 uh, pounds of wheat bread a week, 39 pounds of 39 pounds of fruit and 37 vegetables. And then in stark contrast, the cavins, nine pounds of all grains um, in their, things that are identifiable as, as grain products. There's no doubt. It's, it's another interesting feature of this that it's hard to quantify the components, the cuisine components of the cavin family compared to the other two. Uh, because, of course, in processed foods, you have things smushed together in a way that they aren't in a cuisine environment. It's probably just because the corn is in processed Yeah, it could be. It could, yeah, in, in the form of, you know, corn, fru fructose, corn syrup, right, it may well be. Um, but it's hard to pull them out. It's hard to, to, to see them, right? Uh, so we don't, because we don't see them, you can't talk about them. You could talk about corn if it's corn and you're turning it into masa and all that. But if corn is distributed that way in a post-cuisine environment, what's there to say about it? And then, uh, stark contrast in the, in the snacks, desserts, and prepared foods. All that's probably pretty expectable uh, in, in the contrast between a world that has turned to largely to processed foods and away from a cuisine profile. Um, so in my class, and, and, it, and I think I'm getting close to the end of my time here, but in my class, what, what, one of the things I try to do is to Think about uh, food uh, cuisine environment as one that we can read kind of like a language, that cuisine, uh, cuisines in this sense are organized things. They're not just a random set of foods or just happen to be the foods that are available in a particular environment. <laughs> they are the result of ongoing and long-term selection and categorization and combination of things. So we talk about um, these seven domains of organization in a cuisine. It, so it's the primary edibles, of course, it's the food itself. And in most cuisine environments, it's a highly selective choice from what could actually be e eaten from that environment, right? We, we um, culturally pick what we consider to be edible in the first place, even what we recognize as food in the first place. Versus, and then we make choices between what we consider to be weird or acceptable, familiar or unfamiliar. Uh, all of those are cultural choices, and that's the kind of stuff we talk about in this class. Processing methods, everything from how you cut up food items to obviously how you cook them, uh, to how you preserve them. Um, all of those are in a cuisine environment in this sense are very complicated things, and there's a lot to talk about and, and interesting things to say about them. Repertoire of flavors, a food profile. Uh, a lot of anthropologists would say that that Thing, that food profile is maybe the most defining characteristic of a cuisine. That's how you recognize it. Tastes a certain way. Even if you can't really lay out all the ingredients to produce how it tastes, there is some shared sense of how things should taste. Uh, and that maybe is the most defining thing. Um, the whole repertoire of style, eating styles and behaviors. All that stuff that we, we maybe in the West refer to as table manners or etiquette. Um, is part of this, and th that obviously varies widely and becomes an interesting topic in a cuisine world. Uh, the repertoire of dishes, you know, what are the standard things that get put together? What, what are the combinations of things, of those primary edibles? And then the repertoire of, meal si uh, uh, of meals. What is a meal? We ask this, I ask this question in my class a lot, and it becomes a really interesting issue when we start thinking about what counts as something you would call a meal. And if it isn't a meal, but you eat it, what else is it? What other categories do we have for what we call, how we, how we put food in, in the boxes that are in our head? And, you know, it starts out in, in the class conversation that, that, okay, well, there are things that we consider meals, and then there are snacks. And those are kind of the two big uh, dimensions. And, and some students, you know, eat sort of snack eating, mostly. And, uh, but it's interesting that, that we share this, even though people less and less eat in terms of three meals a day, that structure underlying our food un perceptions of the world is so powerfully rooted in us that my students, even though many of them don't eat that way at all, they still have this basic understanding that's the right way, that's the expected way, that's how we should eat, and there's something wrong with them or with somebody if they don't 
eat three meals a day or that it's somehow wrong? Um, that's, a, that's a cuisine, uh, in many ways, a cuisine question. And then meal cycles. How do we organize meals over the course of time? In the day, in the week, over the seasons, throughout the year, in relation to, to food um, uh, uh, festivals, f I mean, food, food celebratory foods, and so on. A uh, lot more to say about that. I just want to throw up two less pictures, and then I'll stop. Um, this is from the New York Times, which is, which is a, a look at how the breakfast has changed, uh, especially among elite New Yorkers um, over a um, century and a half. Uh, from, in the upper left, um, the kind of, what I would say would be a kind of eating that is still coming out of a cuisine world in my, in my sense, right? So uh, foods that have been eaten, prepared before, eaten again for breakfast in a cold form, um, a kind of continuity between meals that is also characteristic of, of the cuisine system, like I'm talking about, moving eventually toward the more typical breakfast today, or recently, um, r reduced in, in variety, um, prepackaged, basically prepackaged um, food items um, meant for eating on the go, quick convenience eating. And the last thing I'll show, um, the, the, the issue of, um, the, the issue of, of variety is an interesting question to ask in terms of the relation between cuisine world and a post-cuisine world. Um, this is one kind of food variety, right? The flavors of Pringles that you can buy in the store, which is huge and growing all the time. Um, but of course, the Pringle <laughs> is, is the same in, in, in all of these cases. And the food, um, the food chemists have produced these flavorings that can just simply be coated on the basic cardboard-like Pringle potato chip. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, you know, no invidious comparisons here, but uh, that's one kind of variety. That's the kind of variety that's characteristic of a post-cuisine world. Um, the kind of variety that is uh, uh, characteristic of a cuisine world um, is one in which there is a fairly limited and selective set of things, but that, is, that the cuisine experience is varied in terms of our interactions with it, our relations uh, that we have through it how we talk about it, how we have relationships with other people by way of food. That all becomes very complicated and very complex and varied in a cuisine world, even though the food itself might be fairly limited in, in its basic variety. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the last point being that, um, uh, you know, we can make some choices about this, uh, that, that we can cultivate, it maybe on a smaller scale, not regionally anymore, maybe, but at least on a small scale, we can cultivate a kind of inclination toward cuisine-based eating or cuisine relationship to food. And it seems like that would be a good thing if that, if that could happen. Thank you. Thanks. In the classes that you teach, do you teach one or part of this one or parts of them where you actually talk about how humans discovered what they could eat and how they could prepare it? And Early, uh, I don't get too deeply into in Rhoda's domain, like the, the, the science of nutrition and things like that. But yeah, we do talk a little bit about, um, you know, the agricultural revolution, for example. You know, what is it, what happened when humans started to domesticate plants and animals? One of the interesting things that happened was that actually uh, the quality of nutrition declined to some degree um, from moving from hunting gathering to settled agriculture um, led to more food supply, possibility for larger populations, but also reduced quality of, of uh, nutrition. So, um, partly because you did have this concentration into something like a staple grain, which becomes so, became so central in hunting gathering societies, many of them, you have a greater variety of foods that you depend on. Um, so yeah, we do, we do get into things like that. And we also get into uh, the history uh, in America, particularly sort of the more recent history of changes in um, American food ways uh, going back to the 19th century. So yeah, we, we do um, spend time on that uh, in the class. Uh, although the weight is on, uh, well, we do, I do a lot with their own students' own um, food experience. They'd write a journal. In fact, they just um, finished writing a paper. What they do is they write a journal uh, of two weeks of their eating. They keep a, a record of everything they eat. And then um, I exchange the journals and they write a paper about the rules that they see operating in somebody else's food behavior. And that usually yields a really interesting 
cuisine sort of conversation. You know, because they begin to see how um, another student will organize and, and uh, structure the d contrast, for example, between meals and other kinds of eating. And that those are not just random alternations, but they're, they're organized, even though the, the, the other student might not be aware of it. So, so my class is a little more kind of on the ground, their experience, ethnographic based. But we do, we do some of that history too. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, wouldn't you add the category or repertoire of cooking instruments or tools? Yeah, actually. Study of cooking? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was too much to cover. I, I've sort of included that under uh, what the category of, of food related behaviors. Um, I didn't specify it, but yeah, the, the implements, the, the, the tools of cooking and eating are part of, of um, food waste study and cuisine very obviously in, in how you eat stuff. I mean, it, um, if you ask the question of, uh, if we call, and, and this is a, a itself an interesting discussion, Tex-Mex food uh, a cuisine, uh, part of what you'd want to specify in trying to describe that cuisine is how you literally pick up, eat the food, how you, you know, what the, the implements are. And, and obviously cuisines vary widely in how much distance is placed between the food and your mouth um, by way of the utensils you use to prepare and, e and eat it. Um, and a lot of cuisines, traditional cuisines, are you know hand, hand foods. There's a way in which that's also especially true of true cuisine traditions in this sense. You know, um, just as the food is in the post-cuisine world is pre-processed, pre-prepared, in some ways the utensils are also. Um, you know, um, uh, uniform. The, they're, uh, you may have a lot of different forks, but you buy them in the set of forks that all look the same. Um, in traditional cuisines, the, the implements, ha the quality of humanness and biological life about them the same way that the food does. Yeah, Sue, you were going to say. I was curious about the selection of these three cultures and the exclusion of um, cultures that say fishing cultures or uh, the Maasai and their yeah. almost total dependence on meat or <coughs> even the Cajuns and their yeah. hog butchering practices because it's so hot there yeah. and they it's a community event and they all come together to butcher yeah. the hog. And a whole other dimension, fish. interesting dimension of the cuisine tradition. Yeah, I picked these I, out of the, um, he must have 20 or so, 25 examples like this in the book. Um, and one of, one of them being, for example, Greenland, Greenland um, cuisine, um, largely indigenous tradition that is still very much ongoing in which animal foods um, are, are the staple of the diet. Right? So um, sea mammals, um, um, hunted you know, game as central to it, um, that uh, there are a couple of examples that he has that are, that are more like that. Those traditions. In fact, that's one of the things they tried to do is get some kind of global array of, of variety of samplings of kinds of, of food experience. So um, there's that one. There's, a, I think, a Mongolian uh, families food way, food collection, which is a really interesting one. Um, I'm forgetting what all the others are. But the book, rep I, I just picked these. Um, the book represents a wider array of things. Which reminds me of the only piece of trivia that I actually recall from my freshman anthropology survey. <laughs> Which was, you know, which two mammals in the world cannot survive without, cannot, sur cannot uh, survive on vegetable protein. They have to have animal protein because their systems won't um, only two? assimilate. So does that there's, there's only two mammals. Really? And it's cats and Eskimos. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, okay. So, so cats, all cats, right? All, all. The indigenous people of the north uh -huh. uh, evolved over millennia on practically nothing except whale blood. Yeah. Well, that and, and that that's another. I didn't bring this up either, but cuisine traditions. I, one of the one of the ways to think about these things as systems is that uh, we tend to think of the humans as in control, um, but in fact, of course, our bodies are constantly adapting to to the environment around us, They're, the environment has determined us as, as much as we, we determine it. And taking that into consideration is another component of thinking about cuisines in this way. And that's to say, you know, the, the, the distribution of the ability to metabolize milk, for example, 
um, is a good case in point of that. You know, why Northern and Western Europeans and Eastern, uh, peoples from Eastern Africa are the main populations that can actually effectively metabolize liquid milk anyway um, is a function of their adapting to particular environments in, in which they, they live. And yeah, so the human organism, and again, maybe Rhoda will have more to say about this, she knows a lot more about it than I do, is immensely adaptable. Uh, obviously, we're huge omnivores and can eat all sorts of different things, but the body in different places has adapted and adjusted to particular circumstances. Also, the source of a lot of problems in a post cuisine world. If you have indigenous populations who metabolically cannot effectively um, metabolize the complex sugars, the, the effects of the disappearance of their cuisine and replacement by post cuisine eating is a huge health problem, obviously. Maybe I should stop. Yeah. One more? Yeah. Any thoughts on where we're going next in terms of cuisine? That's a, yeah. Era, That's a good. Industrial, yeah. Post-industrial and now regulation. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of things, there are a lot of implications of, of this, uh, of a, in a post-cuisine world. I mean, uh, things like the Pringles, right, where you have this dizzying array of seeming variety and we're lost in how to make choices about it. Um, it, it would be one, one kind of answer, I think, and maybe it's too easy an answer, is that we, we are seeing some food communities, more or less self-conscious food communities, like um, locavore movements and those sorts of things, which uh, are attempting seemingly to, to recover components of cuisine experience in this sense. Um, and that's true. I think that's true in some ways. Um, and local, you know, eating locally as a principle is it consistent with that idea. The fact that that economically is difficult in a post-cuisine world, that, that the ability for everybody in America to be able to do that is, uh, does, is not possible. I mean, it's just economically um, the privilege to have the flexibility resources to recover some of that cuisine tradition. Um, if there were ways, you know, if, if policy could be shifted, federal policy shifted, for example, to promote more of that um, capacity to diversify and localize your food experience, um, we, we could perhaps move a little more in that direction. Um, without a crystal ball, I don't know whether, where we could go in, in uh, America to, to achieve what I think would be a good end if we did that. Yeah. We could go on and yes. on, and I think this is part of my job where I have to stop the conversation. But we will continue in 15 minutes with Rhoda Shantz, and then in our round table, we'll have more opportunity to talk with John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.